Welcome to chapter 16 uh, and in this chapter we will be looking at ways to analyze financial statements. There are generally three um, focuses of financial statement analysis, liquidity, solvency, and profitability. If we are a banker or a lender, we're going to examine financial statements looking for liquidity. In other words, do these folks have enough cash flow to pay their current obligations and continue to buy supplies and make payroll and pay rent and do all of those things as those things come due? And that's what's known as liquidity. Long-term creditors are going to look at the overall solvency. In other words, do the uh, debts of the company exceed the assets? And if that's the case, then a company is generally considered to be insolvent and not in a situation where they're going to be able to sustain their operations over the long haul. And then investors are going to look at profitability. Uh, is the company earning money? Are they going to be able to generate dividends uh, and things of that nature? There's two basic approaches to analyzing financial statements. You can look at a comparative increase or decrease, for example, in earnings or um, the amount of cash that a company has on hand, things of that nature. But we also have a whole series of ratios, many of which you were introduced to probably in your financial accounting class. And there are ratios that are broken down to by liquidity, by profitability, um, and the like, so that uh, those ratios can be utilized to assess those things. When we're looking at the analytical side, we can approach it from a number of ways. We can just look at how we as a company are doing over time, or we can look at how we as a company compare to other similar companies in our region of our size um, and uh, make that determination. So when we're looking at the analytical approach, there are three ways we can uh, look at this. A horizontal analysis, vertical analysis, and then using common sized financial statements. With the horizontal analysis, what we're looking at, um, and it's called horizontal, if you think about a, um, a multi-year income statement. You're going to have, you know, year one, year two, year three in columns. And you can look at a comparison going sort of side to side at revenue, at cost of goods sold, at various expense line items. So you're doing a comparison across years uh, when you're doing the horizontal approach and you're looking at the increases and decreases of whatever relevant line items that you want to look at from year to year. Uh, and Here's a, just a, a brief example of just two years where you would have the amount of increase or decrease followed by the percentage. Then we have vertical analysis. And in vertical analysis, we're going to look at a um, a lower number on a financial statement as it compares to a higher up number and I know that doesn't make a lot of sense but hopefully it will in a second and we'll look at some examples um, but you know each asset would be stated as a percentage of total assets for example um, each uh, liability might be a percentage of total liabilities. So what percentage of your assets are cash, for example? And that would be a way to um, do a vertical analysis. What percentage of your liabilities are current liabilities or long-term liabilities? Be another example of a vertical analysis. So we have the same um, multi-year, you know, we have a two-year balance sheet here, but now we're looking at the percentage. So what percentage, for example, is current assets versus total assets and long-term investments, et cetera, over total assets. So it, it's a way to um, create a sort of an internal percentage or ratio, I should say, of one discrete category of an item to the whole category. That didn't make sense. Scratch that. 
So when we're looking at a vertical analysis, we're going to be looking at everything as a percentage of sales. Then when we look at common size financial statements, and when I work with entrepreneurs, small business owners, and they are first introduced to the idea of a common size financial statement, this is quite often the kind of the aha moment for them because it's very easy to get caught in the weeds on dollar amounts of things. But in a common size financial statement, you're just looking at percentages and it becomes it, it more comparable, I guess, uh, for some business owners to look at how they size up uh, to the competition from a percentage standpoint. And here's our little checkup corner and I will allow you to look at the horizontal and anal uh, vertical analysis on this and then the solution. We're going to move on to looking at liquidity and as I had mentioned earlier there are specific ratios that are designed to measure liquidity. So here we have seven ratios and measures that can be used to assess a company's liquidity. We have those that look at the current position, those that look at accounts receivable, and those that look at inventory. The current position analysis, um, and I'll go over each one of these individually, is the working capital, the current, and the quick ratio. We compute working capital by looking at, it's probably the easiest one, current assets minus current liabilities. That gives you a, a number for working capital. Um, so in this case, we've got uh, current assets uh, in uh, year 2016, let's say 550, current liabilities of 210, and then that gives us a working capital of 2016 of 340,000, and you can see that we had an improvement over our working capital in 2015. Now this uh, working capital number as well as the other ratios we'll talk about in a moment are often used by creditors. You might have a, uh, a loan instrument for example that requires a certain working capital to be kept on hand and lenders may monitor that periodically to ensure that you are in compliance with the loan terms. And what is considered good working capital? And the answer is it's all relative. It depends on the size of the company. Uh, this is a, a good opportunity to really look across industries and see what is a norm for this industry, this geographic region, for a company of this size. The current ratio is another way to measure working capital and it's often called the working capital ratio and it is current assets divided by current liabilities and using the same numbers that we had for the working capital number we can see that we've got a current ratio of 2.6 versus uh, 2.2 the prior year so the higher the working capital ratio what that says is we have you know that many more assets over, uh, I should say current assets, over current liabilities. So we're in that better, that much better a position to use our current assets to pay our current debt. Uh, it is, because it's a ratio, it is easier to compare it across companies than just using the dollar amount of the working capital figure. Then we get to the uh, quick ratio. The major difference between the quick Quick, uh, quick ratio and the current ratio is that the numerator isn't just current assets, it's what's known as quick assets. And the major difference is we're not going to be including things like uh, inventory in our quick assets. So for the most part, and uh, as your slide says, prepaid assets. So if you have prepaid insurance and inventory, we're going to subtract those out of our current assets before we calculate the numerator. So why would we bother to drill down and look at a quick ratio rather than a current ratio? And the quick ratio is also referred to sometimes as the acid test ratio. In other words, if worse comes to worse and this company needs to get its hands on quick cash, immediate cash, 
how how well can it do that and satisfy its immediate current liabilities? So um, we don't want to have to expect a company to liquidate inventory. This really says how well can they get their hands on money in the short run to be able to meet immediate obligations. And so this is the current ratio of the Lincoln and Jefferson companies. And now computing the quick ratio, we see that companies that went from identical current ratios, when we subtract out the um, non-quick assets, all of a sudden these look like two very different companies from a liquidity standpoint. Uh, accounts receivable analysis is something else that a company wants to keep track of and there are two measures of this. One is the accounts receivable turnover and the number of days in receivables. Uh, and this basically tells us how well we are doing collecting the money that we're owed. The accounts receivable turnover is sales versus average accounts receivable. Now remember when you're calculating this ratio that we're looking at the average. So what does that mean? That means beginning accounts receivable figure plus the ending accounts receivable figure divided by two to get to that average. And so, and again, your numerator is your sales. We're going to use the Lincoln Company to calculate the accounts receivable turnover for two years, year uh, 05 and 06. Ordinarily, when you're asked to calculate an accounts receivable turnover, you're going to be given two columns of years. Um, and one column will be, and you'll be asked to calculate a receivable turnover on a particular year, chances are it will be the later year because you're going to need the beginning accounts receivable figure in order to calculate that average. So they're giving you that earlier year because that ending accounts receivable figure is going to be used along with the ending accounts receivable figure for your current year to calculate that ratio. Here they just gave those both to you to do the math. Now we see that our accounts receivable turnover ratio went up from 9.2 to 12.7. Well, what does that mean? And effectively, the higher the number, the better for this ratio. Not all ratios, just, you know, this one in particular and a few others. So what this means is this looks at how often they were able to turn over their accounts receivable during the course of the year. Um, and so 12.7 times they were able to do it in 2016 or 06 versus 9.2 times. So that suggests that their customers are paying more quickly and they're able to, um, again, turn those receivables over faster. Looking at receivables in terms of days sales is particularly helpful. That basically says, well, how many of our days sales have we not collected that are still sitting in our uh, accounts receivable? The way that we calculate that is that we get the average accounts receivable and that's now your numerator and then your average daily sales. To get the average daily sales, you're going to do the sales divided by 365. So you're going to run this little equation first, plug that in as your denominator, and that's going to get you the day's sales in receivables. So for same company, we've got 39.5 for year 2005 and 28.6 for the following year. So we had uh, 39 and a half days of sales revenue sitting uncollected in our accounts receivable in 2005. We improved on that, managed to shave, uh, what, 11 days or so off of that uh, a year later. So we are improving that. And ideally, the lower you can get that number, the better. And this basically is what I just said. So now we're moving on to inventory analysis. And like accounts receivable, we're going to look at inventory turnover and we're going to look at um, the day's sales and inventory that we're sitting on. Now, um, whereas accounts receivable, we're worried about not collecting 
our accounts receivable timely. With inventory, we're worried about it sitting around too long, becoming old, spoiled, outdated, obsolete, whatever that is. So we want to make sure that we are not sitting on too much inventory. The inventory turnover ratio is for the numerator, you're looking at cost of goods sold over average inventory. And so getting the average inventory is just like you did with the average accounts receivable. You're going to have, in this case, they just gave you the beginning and ending numbers for each of those years so that you could then calculate uh, the ratios for both of them. But normally you're just going to be given uh, year one, year two, and you're going to have to figure out, oh, I need both of those figures to calculate the average year two's inventory um, to, to do this ratio. So we have 2.8 versus 3.8. Uh, again, with the turnover, the higher is better. So it is the frequency at which we are turning over our inventory. and Uh, just like with the accounts receivable, we want to know in days what we have sitting in our inventory uh, sales-wise. We're going to take the average inventory and then we're going to calculate average daily cost of goods sold. To get that, you've got your cost of goods sold divided by 365. Uh, plug that into your denominator and that tells you what your daily cost of goods sold is. Uh, in inventory. So um, uh, year 2005, we had 132 days worth of cost of goods sold inventory sit sitting in our inventory. We managed to improve that a year later and knocked off, I don't know, what, 37 days on that. So that's a, a, a pretty significant improvement. Um, and so again, that tells us basically roughly the amount of time it takes us to purchase, sell, and replace that inventory. And I will just pause here and let you go through the checkup corner. I'm going to stop this video here and move on to the next one to talk about solvency.